Um, I don't have a picture of Table Mountain um, because I haven't got to go there yet, but my 11-year-old son just sent me a selfie and said, nice view, and so I'm going to just return the favor. (laughs) And I'll send that to him. (laughs) And he probably won't care. So... (laughs) Um, I was so pleased this morning to hear um, the, the discussion about how important it is to continue to talk about behavioral prevention, even as we move forward with more biomedical prevention approaches. And that's sort of the overall theme of what I'm going to talk to you about this morning, really looking specifically at PrEP uptake among gay and bisexual men based on some of the research that we've been doing in the United States. So we know that effectiveness does not necessarily lead to high uptake with PrEP. Um, PrEP was approved in the U.S. in 2012, and certainly the the data shows that it's very effective. Um, And in 2014, CDC identified the criteria for what makes a good PrEP candidate, what sort of behaviors um, might one be engaging in that would make them an appropriate candidate for PrEP. And yet, in 2016, it was reported that there were only about 80,000 people on Truvada, which is the the once daily oral prep um, available in the United States. And we've been doing a national study of over 1,000 gay and bisexual men in the U.S., which I'll be presenting on, um, where they did not have to report any sexual risk to be in the sample. So this is a, a sample of not necessarily risky gay and bisexual men. And we found that 64.5% of them met these objective CDC criteria. And so if you extrapolate that there's supposed to be about 7.4 million MSM, and if 64.5% are eligible, so about 4.7 million probably meet criteria, and we've got about 80,000 comments. So um, if it works, why isn't everybody taking it, right? Where have we heard this before? There is this perception um, among people that if you simply provide people a medication that will keep them healthy, they will take it. And it's that easy. Um, Physicians often say, I don't understand. My patient had a heart attack, and yet they continue to smoke. Behavior change isn't necessarily this easy, magic wand, flip a switch kind of thing. And so we have to really sort of be cognizant of that. Now, one of the nice things about the HIV Care Cascade is that it really presented a number of opportunities for behavioral interventions to have an effect, because you didn't just sort of rush to deal with adherence as the, as the primary intervention. We also recognized the need for, for interventions focused on things like linkage to care, reten- retention in care and engagement, and those kind of factors that lead you to that end point of the cascade. So in thinking about a PrEP cascade, we can sort of think of some of the same kinds of things, like acceptability. How willing are people to do this? What what prevents their considering PrEP, as an example question? Planning to get on PrEP, or actual behavioral intentions to start taking the medication. Where can they get PrEP? Have they tried this? This is an option before. Taking the necessary steps to initiate PrEP, which is the, the direct precursor to uptake. So looking at things like how is their patient provider communication? Because we know that's going to be critical for them to be able to deal with this. And then actively engaging in a, in a PrEP regimen or, or maintenance where it's not just adherence to the medication, but also to some of the HIV and STI testing requirements and physician visits. So we have been carrying out a study called 1,000 Strong, which is a sample of over 1,000 gay and bisexual men across the U.S. to try to look at um, kind of emerging issues in HIV and sexual health among gay and bisexual men. And it's a sample that is predominantly gay identified with a few bisexually identified men. It's about 30% men of color, um, about half and half single versus in a relationship. It's a fairly um, high income and well-educated sample, and they're distributed all across the United States uh, with a mean age of 40 ranging from 18 to 79. Um, We have men from every state except South Dakota. We apparently could not find the one gay man in South Dakota, (laughs) I guess. Not really sure what happened there, but um, we do have, we do obviously have more representation in sort of larger urban areas, but we do also have those from more suburban and rural areas, so a, a fairly nice distribution. 
we first, with this study, started looking at familiarity and awareness. Um, and this was in 2016, or, uh, 2014. So by this point, a fair amount of people had heard of PrEP. And so when we sort of tried to ask these men what was their sort of awareness, um, only 10% of our baseline sample had never heard of PrEP. Now, they didn't necessarily know all of the nuances of it, but the vast majority of them had heard of this as a sort of biomedical prevention option. But very few of them were actually on PrEP. And so at, this, at the point that the data were first collected in 2014, about 6% um, were prescribed PrEP. And some had been previously prescribed it, but the vast majority had never been prescribed. When we started to look at their willingness, about 53%, more than half, said that they were willing to take PrEP, and only 41% um, said that they were unwilling. So we were really sort of pleased by this and thought that, that that willingness would most likely lead to substantial uptake. Well, then we started to try to figure out what it is we're talking about with willingness versus intentions. And we found some major differences, because with the same sample, when we looked at how willing are you, to go on PrEP, we see that more than half said that they're definitely or probably willing to go on PrEP. And this is even when we gave them a more detailed description of what's involved. But then when we asked, do you intend to go on PrEP in the near future, you see the vast majority are like, nope. I can be willing to do a lot of things, but I'm not necessarily going to actually do it. And so I think we have to get really clear in our questions of what are we asking, because willingness does not necessarily equate to intentions. We also identified a number of barriers that were perceived to going on PrEP, very similar to barriers uh, to go on ART in general. Health consequences, provider-related stigma, social stigma, some real behavioral issues that are related to biomedical prevention. But actually the biggest barrier in our sample was simply viewing oneself as an appropriate candidate for PrEP. And we found that's where we lost the majority of folks, because even though they were objectively a candidate based on CDC criteria, they just didn't see themselves as a candidate for PrEP. And so I think we have a lot of work to do in that area to sort of destigmatize the use of PrEP as a prevention strategy. So we then wanted to try to develop a PrEP cascade of some kind. And so we put this out um, in 2000, er, in March of, of this year in Jade's, and we decided to, sorry, uh, there we go. We decided to use the trans theoretical model as kind of a theoretical background. And so we came up with what we thought of as the kind of stages of change for PrEP uptake. And in part, we picked this model because it's a model that is pretty familiar to case managers, um, health navigators, health educators, the people, at least in the United States, who are the primary folks helping um, men to get on PrEP. And so we start with objective identification. Um, are you HIV negative and, and at high risk for infection according to CDC criteria? And then you move into stage one, which is unwilling to take it or I just don't see myself as a candidate. Stage two, contemplation, where I'm willing and I self-identify myself as a good candidate, but my intentions are not yet there. So that's that willingness group. Stage three of preparation, the intentions need to be there. So they have a potential provider. They're intending to do this. Action and initiation means that they've spoken to the provider about it, and they've actually gone to get the prescription and started it. And then maintenance is, is about returning for the quarterly testing. Um, and at any time, you can sort of discontinue PrEP and go back into the stages. You can also become diagnosed with HIV and then go into the care cascade. So this is what we found. Um, this is just the folks who were objectively identified. Um, that about, but slightly more than half of them stayed in that pre-contemplation stage. They just weren't thinking about it. They didn't see themselves as a prep candidate. This isn't really for them. You drop down and 47% have at least reached the stage of, of thinking about this. But then we see a big drop off into that intention. We see it drops down to less than a quarter. And then those who are actually getting on prep drops down to 13%. You see less of a drop-off, though, when it comes to maintenance and insurance. So once we actually get people to that point, at least the men in our study were doing pretty well with regard to their um, adherence. So for us in this sample, adherence isn't the problem. Um, the rates of 30-day adherence, the rates of 90-day adherence, you see, are all in the, in the 90s. And that is 
very good. Now, this is self-report, of course, um, but still, that's fairly high rates of adherence. And when we look at adherence to medical appointments, we also see some fairly high rates. So it doesn't seem that it's those folks at the end of the cascade that are the challenge. It's really getting people to identify as a candidate and really get to that point of having intentions that seems to be the barrier. So biomedical prevention is about behavior. Some other things that we found were among those who are, who are objectively identified as candidates for PrEP, those who were least likely to see themselves as a candidate had less social support, they had more HIV stigma, and both of these factors were also related to not being willing to talk to their healthcare provider about PrEP. So those are definitely psychosocial things that we can intervene on and work with men to get more comfortable in dealing with this situation. Compared to PrEP candidates not on PrEP, the men on PrEP reported more sexual satisfaction and less sexual anxiety. So we're seeing significant kind of psychological benefits for these men who are on PrEP um, because of the alleviated concerns about HIV infection. So that's something that I don't think we've done a good enough job kind of selling to men in terms of suggesting PrEP as an option. You're saying, you know what, people who go on PrEP, they're actually more sexually satisfied and they have less anxiety around sex. We, um, we now have data through 24 months, and, and what we have seen in this sample um, is a, a pretty consistent increase in the number of people who are initiating PrEP. Um, we survey the men every six months. And so now we're up to about 15% of the sample who is currently on PrEP. But we also see some discontinuation, some people who go off, who cycle on and off at various times. And so we wanted to sort of look at why people had discontinued PrEP to kind of see where our behavioral um, indicators might be there. And the biggest reason for discontinuing PrEP had to do with risk reduction. They either stopped engaging in condomless anal sex or they entered a monogamous relationship. These were the major reasons that our men have said that they've stopped taking PrEP. Very few men reported insurance coverage issues or costs. A few did, but much less so than risk reduction related issues. Um, and a few men have talked about negative side effects. Um, but by and large, the reasons for discontinuing PrEP are behavioral. And so I think we need to consider that as well. So in summary, a large majority of the men in our sample were objectively identified as appropriate candidates for PrEP. And again, this in a sample of men who were not recruited for their sex risk behavior. Um, of those, fewer than half were willing to take PrEP and self-identified as a good candidate. So we're losing about half the men who could objectively benefit from PrEP at each step of the way up to and including initiation or uptake. So only about one in 10 men who need PrEP are actually on a PrEP prescription. The good news, once we get them on PrEP, they seem to be doing well. We obviously need to explore that more with more um, biological indicators of adherence. 98% though said that they were adherent to the regimen and 72% adherent to the recommended visit schedule of quarterly STI testing and HIV testing with their doctors. The most prominent barriers are perceived inappropriateness and lack of intentions. Again, things that we can intervene on behaviorally. Not obtaining a PrEP prescription um, we did find stigma really driving that, so another thing that we can focus on. So a lot of these barriers are purely psychological, um, and, and we can really develop interventions designed to address that. Psychoeducation, risk assessment, motivational interviewing are all some strategies that may be effective in this area. We did not see any significant differences at any of the stages of the PrEP cascade by race, ethnicity, or region of the country. So it was, it, those were not factors driving that. Um, obviously, the, the data on the cascade itself is cross-sectional. Now we're looking at changes or, or movement in the cascade over time, so we will be able to look at that. This is a national, um, a large national sample that tried to be representative of census data on same-sex households, which is unfortunately um, the best indicator we have, and certainly with our current administration, which you might have heard of, we're not going to be advancing that anytime soon. But it does over-represent the experience of, of white, educated, and higher-income men. Um, and our sample overwhelmingly had access to insurance, which we know is a major barrier to PrEP. So I, I do think one overlooked question for folks to continue to think about is what are the critical differences between taking the pill that seems necessary, like ART for people living with HIV, versus one that seems optional and is often presented um, as such. When we're talking about the same behavior, does the mere act of framing it as prevention versus treatment change the way people respond to it? And I think behaviorally, this is one of the things that we really need to explore 
um, as we move forward with biomedical prevention. Um, I want to acknowledge our funders and a number of our folks and our participants, and that's it. Thank you.